22nd day of June, 2023. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank we don't normally do moments of silence at our work sessions, only at our main meetings, but um, we did uh, just a, a couple days ago, lost somebody very dear to one of us, uh, Tommy John's mom, um, and O'Rox Givoni passed away on Tuesday, June 20th, literally two years to the day after the death of her husband, Fran. Um, her love of family and friends was everything to her. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting her a number of times. Um, she was a dynamic woman, uh, full of uh, grace and humor, and uh, I know a very loving mother to, to you, Tommy John, a very uh, strong and inspirational woman. So uh, I know it must be a tremendous loss for the Scavoni family to lose somebody like her. And um, we will on the uh, Next Tuesday, we'll honor her uh, once again with a moment of silence. Um, the, uh, the wake will be Monday, uh, June 26th, 4 to 8 p.m. at Yardley and Penal Funeral Home uh, at 91 Hampton Street in Sag Harbor. The funeral is scheduled for Tuesday, June 27th at 11 a.m. at St. Andrew's uh, Roman Catholic Church at 122 Division Street in in Sag Harp. So, um, you know, all of our condolences to you um, and Andrea and uh, the Scavoni family. And uh, let's join together for a brief moment of silence in her memory. Thank you, Supervisor, and thank you to the board for that uh, thoughtful moment of silence. And I appreciate it. We can help and support you, Tommy John, through this period. Thank you. You have. You just let us know. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with agenda review. We have a meeting coming up on Tuesday, as I mentioned, the 27th. And uh, it'll be an evening meeting, 6 p.m. here at Town Hall. It'll also be hybrid. Um, hopefully, we'll have the uh, hybrid system working. System is working. All right. <laughs> so uh, we have only three hearings scheduled, which is good. Um, public hearing to amend Town Code Chapter 283, special events in order to enhance enforcement ability, clarify definitions, and restructure application procedures. Second public hearing amends uh, code chapter 31220 to designate no parking on the center median of Maryland Boulevard and Hampton Bays. And the third is a public hearing on uh, enforcement action at 6 Ashwood C Court, North Sea, Southampton, uh, to remove hazardous accumulation of material. And um, any questions about those public hearings? Just a note, we're probably going to, we're obviously still going to have that public hearing on 6th Ashwood, but I don't think we are going to need enforcement action because it appears that the property owner took care of everything. Just cleaned it up. Yep. Okay. Well, maybe the threat of enforcement action <laughs> was enough to uh, <laughs> get some out. motivation. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we move on to resolution. So, Rick, do you want to read the first? Sure. Resolution 800 2023. Uh, resolution authorizing enforcement action at one Squires Pond Road on sanitary condition water supply. It's on board resolution 801 of 2023, a resolution of adoption amending town code chapter 312-62, implement a parking by permit only pilot program at Wildwood Lake Park for weekends and federal holidays, Memorial Day, Juneteenth, Independence Day, Labor Day from May 15th to May to September 15th for a one year period. And I think, uh, yeah, if I could co-sponsor that, please. Sure. 
Town Board Resolution ID 43007, authorized purchase of Kubota tractor from Alvey's Equipment Company Incorporated using New York State OPS contract. Second. Second. So next, uh, 43618, authorized purchases from Millbourne Sales Company Inc. doing business as Millbourne Flooring Mills. 43624, authorized purchase of general building maintenance services involving new construction, reconstruction, and demolition from the new contracting and restoration, Inc. using the Bayshore Union Free School District contract. Down board resolution ID 43620, authorized the supervisor to execute a lease agreement with Quadrant for a DS641-INT2SE folding inserting machine. I'm not quite sure what that means. Mail, I think. Oh, it's for mailers. <laughs> Town Board Resolution ID 43605. Uh, to authorize the supervisor to sign a 2023 extension with Palmanock Environmental LLC for pr uh, private or municipal markets for the disposal services of solid, uh, so municipal solid waste. 43623. Authorize the supervisor to sign a 23 agreement with Municipal Services Inc. 43606, authorized use of use and stuff with proceeds cooperative bidding program for school year 2023 to 24, joint municipal cooperative bidding program. Uh, 43569, declare item surplus and authorize disposal of vehicle. Um, vehicles. Um, 43650, 2023. Notice the bidders for used 2021 Ford Transit passenger wagon. 43645 as a 23 notice to bidders for printing of forms for fire prevention. 43628 accepts 2022 audited financial statements from Naraki Smith LLP for the town of Southampton and authorized town clerk to publish notice of 2022 financial report. 43625 accepts the December 31, 2022 Community Preservation Fund audit from Colin and Donowski, LLP, for the Town of Southampton. Authorize the Town Clerk to publish notice of the Community Preservation Fund financial statements and independent auditor's report. 43646 is amends the 23 uh, budget for various departments. Housekeeping Resolution 43627 authorizes the supervisor to sign statement of annual financial and operating information and file with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Resolution ID 43654, accept resignation of Gail Lombardi from the Hampton Bay CAC. Resolution ID 43655, accept resignation of Margaret Friedlander from the Hampton Bay Civic Advisory Committee. Town Board Resolution ID 43634, Resolution authorizing intermunicipal agreement with Southampton Village for use of the LRB pursuant to Town Code Chapter 143-14 Cooperative Agreements for Administration and Enforcement. Town Board Resolution 43635, 2023 home sales price and rental formula multipliers for units reserved for uh, income eligible households. Can I just go back, Rick, on Margaret Freelander? I know she stepped out as chair. Did she step off the committee completely? Yes. yes. Okay. Let's do that. Um, so, what are we up to? Page 26. To one, which is not, uh, Town Board Resolution 43647, authorization of cost reimbursement waiver for Friends of the Big Duck tag. Sale fundraiser at Blue Barn on July 1st, 2023, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Town Board Resolution ID 43649, waive showmobile fee for East Quag Fire Department annual seafood and beer festival. 43616, authorized Fire Marshal Joseph Hernandez to attend the New York State Fire Academy training, Introduction to Fire Investigation, July 17th to August 11th, 2023, in Montour Falls, New York. Sunday, could you add me as a co-sponsor on the 43649 for East Quag Fire Department? Certainly. Um, 43472 appoints Charles Briscoe to planner position and land management. 43565 accepts resignation of the heavy equipment operator in the highway department. 
43563, accepts resignation of a public safety dispatcher. Three in the police department, 43636, accepts resignation of an audiovisual production specialist in education and government channel. 43176, accepts retirement of police officer John Cooey. Uh, from Southampton Police Department, 43639 is a public hearing notice for acquisition of a portion of lands of Villa J J I L S uh, located at 212 uh, Little Noyak Path in the Hamlet of Watermill. Town Board Resolution ID 43644, notice of public hearing to enact a new chapter 316 entitled Moratorium on Battery Energy Storage Systems to prohibit new applications pursuant to 330-162-21 of the town code for three months. So let's pause for a second because I know there's been a lot of talk about this and this would set a hearing for July 11th and uh, this would affect um, new applications. New applications. So ones right, that are already in process will continue to be processed. That are uh, applications already received, right? Correct. All right. Um, and the purpose of this is to like, give the planning uh, the board more time, or to to give the, the planning code. board time for um, education opportunities to give the board time to review the code and make changes. I believe we had conversations about adopting the new the latest fire protection standards. Janice, can I bring you up for a second? I hate to put you on the spot here. So because we did adopt the battery energy storage code, I, 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 I get battery energy storage is a critical component of our future in terms of being able to shift to wind and solar and you know renewable forms of energy um, and to avoid additional polluting infrastructure um, and overhead wires and things like that so uh, and I know you New York State is very big on <coughs> promoting battery energy storage so we put a code in place um, and uh, I, I know uh, you work really hard on that code. Are you envisioning some potential changes to that code or not necessarily? Um, so yes, we worked on the code, um, you may recall, as part of our sl Climate Smart Communities program. There was a number of different um, implementation uh, things we could do to score points, to become like bronze and silver and go up. Mm -hmm. And um, we, um, one of the things was to do the stretch code, and we did that. And the other one was battery energy storage system, so we did that. Um, in the interim, um, as you know, many people became concerned that we didn't look at um, enough, you know, information to make everyone feel that this is a land use that we can be comfortable with. Um, so we are um, going to go back and look through it again I, I, and make sure that we cross all our T's and dot all our I's. And, you know, people say, how can you put it here or there? It really has to do with energy consumption and storing energy is not you know we're not um none of this was ever intended to like construct chernobyl here like we're trying to create just battery yeah. storage to store energy from the grid and handle the intermittency of renewable energy as you know wind and solar it's not always happening at this you know, know it's not always windy it. or it's not always sunny so the batteries store the power um well, and we reviewed the original zoning i know we approached it as a relatively benign issue well, the good news is that battery storage, when you, you know, putting aside for just for a moment the safety considerations, and when you consider battery storage as a land use, you don't really have, you know, the comings and goings. There's no Once traffic. it's in, there's no traffic, there's no, you know, like intensification. It's just on and storing energy. However, um, we, and when we did implement the code, we did talk to our um, fire safety personnel and people like that. And so now, there have been new national in the in the wake of different things happening nationally. There there may be new fire prevention codes that are that we can adopt or we can put in place that we would have conditioned anyway. But we can uh, take a look at that. Uh, we can go back to our um, fire personnel and and emergency personnel and make sure there's no. Um, there seems to be like two dominant different 
battery energy storage systems. There's the lithium iron phosphate systems and the lithium ion systems. And they seem to be very different in terms of their thermal properties. So um, I, I don't know whether we can promote one system over another, but. The one that is proposed is the one that includes the phosphate, which is the slow burn. That's for the canal non -toxic, property. Non-toxic, correct. The other one is lithium ion, is it not? Or it's not that, even. That's not even an application at the that's moment. That was a pre yeah. Okay. So there's only one current application. Now, can we make that better, um, you know, more safe, scaled down, moved over? Can we work with it? The question is, um, you know, there's, there's, we don't want it, but then there's, well, what are the reasons why you don't want it? You know, the locational standards in the code today take into account, you know, staying away from certain things, opportunity areas, avoidance areas. Um, but we're happy to and go you know, back through it and, and look at everything over again. In, in listening to the planning board hearing, um, it seemed like the concerns were like threefold or fourfold. Um, you know, thermal concerns, fire prevention was seemed the big one, groundwater, and noise um, seemed like the main concerns. Um, I never, you know, you know, in reviewing the code, I didn't think that batteries really made a sound, but I guess there's some cooling involved. so. But the code does have provisions for decibel levels. Yes. Correct. It's all it's all special exception use, and the question is: so special exception means it's not necessarily permitted only if you can meet these standards, right? So, so we enacted certain you enacted certain standards, and we did work with the NYSERDA, their guidebook. We worked. We created our own internal working group, um, and we looked at those things. Um, we said in the code it, it cannot exceed noise standards today. It, ca it has to be in a location identified as an opportunity area. Why is it an opportunity area? And the current one is because it's just adjacent almost, you know, to the substation and you're right. not losing energy. Um, and the east side of the canal is very important to us to have batteries. Um, because sure. of the intermittency and the, and the fact well, that... Well, I'm reading some of the more scholarly articles on lithium iron phosphate um, they're you know considered non-combustible and non-toxic which is uh, very different from the testimony that I was hearing at the point like I think there may be some education that needs to happen within well, the you're community. the chemistry expert here in the, and well, more I don't so know than me expert. but I, I would the, say uh, degree yeah, in chemistry there's but there's plenty <clears throat> of information out there I'm trying to um, find lithium iron phosphate um, installations that currently exist so I can talk to people in those communities but um, I think that you know there's public education that perhaps needs to happen and it, um, it really is depending upon what methodology what technology is being employed at these battery energy storage systems they're, they're not all identical right so um, and Chance. particularly the ones that are, are manufactured to UL standards, in particular, the UL standard, A50, um, the, the UL standard and their testing regimen are the things that actually control that. And I know this particular system that we're talking about right now is, was tested under those standards. So that, you know, getting as part of what you're talking about. Well, I just, if we're going to have a moratorium, I just want to make sure we're basing it on, you know, correct information, factual information. And you know, if the planning board feels, or if you feel as you know, the administrator that the code may need some revisions and we don't want to have additional applications finalized um, that would be reviewed under the current code, that's, that's one thing. And I, I think that's important. And we can look at you know, the scale perhaps and whether, you know, we had said residential areas were appropriate Maybe if it's over a certain size, um, you know, maybe in residential areas is not appropriate. Maybe they need to be in commercial or industrial areas. But I think those things can be looked at. Right. The um, it wasn't you know the residential side of things was in in locations that had fit those other criteria as well. So it's not just you know this is um, open to anyone. The idea was that the the special exception for larger installations. May or may not be because we have a lot of sand mines that are in residential areas or, or like quasi industrial uses, and that's where that opportunity park comes in. So, so it's not just like we have a lot of we're putting them in the middle of your neighborhood, we're putting them in, in, even though it's residentially zoned, the parcel has certain characteristics that make it 
available like an industrial parcel. So, but we can look at that. Like, like we're, utility you know, uses. We'll look at whatever you want. Well, often in residential areas, the power stations, well, wellhead locations. Um, the the you know. The the idea is to make sure that people have power, and and especially in these storms, and and the resiliency of having available power is important. However, you want to accomplish that, that goal is still there. Well, we have a goal, right? We're trying to move Try off it. of non-renewables. Right, and you know, the, there's a cost avoidance when you create battery storage because you're not bringing out all that infrastructure and all that from fossil fuel plants. Um, but, but when you have a planning board that's not comfortable with it and a public that's not comfortable with it, you're going to face every application that comes before the planning board with this level of, you know, mistrust. I think, from a trust standpoint, taking three months and saying we're going to look at the code and we're going to make sure we adopt the latest fire protection codes and we speak to our first responders again and, you know, go through all of these steps and, you know, maybe 50 foot setbacks to residential <coughs> properties don't make sense for large scale systems. Um, there's certain things I think we can look at and I think everybody needs a level of comfort. Otherwise, we're just going to fight this battle over and over and over again until everyone's comfortable. I'm not saying everyone's going to be on board 100%, but right now, I mean, if you're reading the letters that are coming in, mm. people you know, people are, are scared. Very scared. I mean, talking about selling their homes. I mean. Yeah, no, I read it. I got to watch the hearing, too. So, But a, a lot of it, I think, is based on um, information that would um, be applicable to a different type of system, the uh, lithium-ion system rather than the lithium-iron phosphate system. So I just want to make sure that people, or magnesium, or which people, people are reacting to factual information. Um, so we need to start there. Then we need to know what the batteries are, type of batteries being installed there. You know what? We did. What is the catastrophe? What is the catastrophe? You know, if it does catch on fire, how is the suppression? How is, is the fire department trained? And we do last, have a meeting and, coming up with yeah. all of those folks to to ensure that. Um, yeah. Well, and and lastly, what, what are the gases that come off this? How are they toxic, you know, and so on, if something does happen? Those I are mean, the questions. I mean, you know, we can ask them the to, like, do different things, like line liners for stormwater so that, they, you know, nothing's going into the groundwater. We can look at, you know, making sure mm -hmm. there's hydrants or fire suppression. Sound barriers, um, berms, or sound, sound walls. You know, you, you, sound is not just on the site when you're in the middle of it. Sound has to do with where you're at the property line, just like light. Right, we don't go from we go from the property line because that's where you know we always say zero foot candles and on for lighting can't spill off the property drainage can't spill off the property noise can't spill off your property so it's the same for everything um, so we will we can look at that as well We're, you know Genesis. any other thing you want us to look at we'll look at it thank you when we adopted this we a lot of these discussions were had at the time and and we did discuss the. National Fire Protection Association standards. They're, these are national standards. Um, by the way, this is a professional association of firefighters in the United States. They put out standards for these things. Our code currently references those standards. Yes. Right. So anything that gets put in, whatever the thing is, you know, it has to abide by the NFPA current standards. And those standards for for all uh, things are evolving. Right, we we learn new things about dry cleaners and gas stations yeah. and all kinds of, and battery storage facility, and their standards would probably change as operational procedures change as well. If we were to adopt that in our code, and this is, uh, I'm, I've thought about this and, and we discuss this, we would kind of make a static, uh, we, we would make it our code, and it couldn't change necessarily, all that all that easy. That's why we reference the NFPA standards because of the changing nature of the standard operational procedures of firefighting and you know all the things that they do right because I, I i know we had this discussion we also discussed uh the medallions on on uh, electric meters for residential battery storage and uh, mapping them out for fire departments so they know that these things exist in our in our communities but um so i guess my question is is it enough that we reference that in our code we reference NFPA standards. Well, I'll, I'd have to find out if there's any other standards that we don't reference. But yes, in, the, in, a, in as much as we reference those standards, and we also say as may be amended from time to time. So we any say application when we reference something like that, we usually say that because that way we keep up with whatever they um, 
not. So any yeah. application that comes in has to be up to current standards, and if the standards change, they would then be required to change as the standards change. That's correct. But um, we do reference so those I, I NFPA standards, there, but, there but there may be more. I don't know if we necessarily need to put that into our code because but I, we already referenced it. I asked Ryan Murphy about that, and there are newer standards that haven't been adopted yet, but are I think they're European standards or something that exceed what's currently adopted here, and that's what they want to use because they address a lot of the issues that the older European codes standards address. that are currently not adopted by the An National Fire Protection Association. You can, I can ask Ryan Murphy for clarification, but there were, but said. there were, there were standards that exceed what is currently adopted. I think he said by the state. Well, no, it was actually it's a national, uh, it's a national association, and their their code. I think it's eight fifty five is the code that's that is currently we currently recommend because that's the the code that currently exists, and and we we reference it because as as it changes, as as the fire association learns new things, they change the code. We don't have to keep changing the code all the time. But I mean, I, I can ask works. Ryan and, and John Rankin for this for the particulars. But they did say there are newer standards that have not yet been adopted, yeah, and I, I, and I believe they said that this application actually meets those standards that are above what we it, have it, adopted. It does because because they were tested under the UL standards, which is guided by that fire prevention code 855. I, I believe that's the way it is, and there are that is the standard now. There's an attempt to get that actually as a national code at some point, but in the meantime, that's what the reference. I've, I've had. I think those are the codes that he wanted us to adopt. To, yeah, that's well, and that's what exists or right reference. now. That's reference exactly. Yeah. All right. So, so I just I actually want not really a question, but I'm going to use my opportunity as a question to to make a statement because we talk about all the technical details of this, but I also want to point out the reason why we're doing this. You know, we're a coastal community and. We have geologists up and down the southern coast right now testing for saltwater intrusion. We're starting to see the effects of that. We're doing this not for us, but for future generations. And the switch to renewable fuels is so critically important. Right now, your electricity comes from 90%. It's 90% of that is fossil fuel. And fossil fuel is a contributory big problem to, to climate change and global warming. And most of our oxygen on the planet, almost 70% of it comes from the oceans. So we're doing this for a reason, and it may not be readily apparent at this time, but going into the future, I'm trying to do this for my grandkids and their kids and their kids and their kids. So, so I kind of make that association with somebody who had some great vision a long time ago who decided, hey, maybe we ought to provide water in the Southern California Water Authority was created for the same reason, because somebody looks forward to see what problems could possibly come and this is a big issue to us, to the planet, and to us as a coastal community. So, so, do you like that statement? That's my question. Me personally, of <laughs> yeah. course. I okay. mean, that's our goal. You are all policymakers here. You adopt your policies, and one of the policies is to statements. have renewable <laughs> energy. And uh, I just think that I just would like to say moratoriums aren't always guaranteed. They have to go through Suffolk County Planning Commission, um, and people do need to understand like if you the the purpose of the moratorium is to stop tinker tweak and then have it on the books again the the idea that you're not necessarily looking to repeal battery storage within the town is an important point i think so everybody so we manage expectations um because if you repealed it and you don't you know the moratorium is like Nobody wants battery storage, we should get rid of this. I think it has more to do with, let's make sure we do this in the safest possible way. That's the least obtrusive, and that's the entire point of zoning. Well, so this, that's really all This, we can as do. written, affects future applications, if not current applications. Right? You have, you have mm, the way that it was written is that the current application can still continue because they made application in good faith under a code that you adopted, and they're looking to move forward so the um, can now can the planning that. board you know approve that with conditions or make them change things they, they have that right right now you don't need you know they could add conditions right now um, but you what you're saying is the door is shut you cannot come in for three months until we make sure this is ironclad anyone else cannot come in and make an application that's a whole what a moratorium is it's a it like it's like a stop period where you can, cannot 
make application normally it's your right to make an application you're you're saying you don't you so cannot make application for three months so it's, on, it's under like this, this is a somewhat bifurcated so there's there's two pieces here one is that the planning board needs to understand the technology more and they could be doing that now they could be educating themselves they are the other piece of this and i know that they are the other piece of it is whether our code is sufficient to address community concerns um, and that's something that the moratorium could allow us to potentially modify the code before the next application comes in so, right all right um so Janice, is there somebody from the national organizations that's setting up these guidelines that could actually come speak to us, to the planning board, to the public? Can, you know, yeah, we we found some groups that we can uh, you help us with the educational piece, and then we can reach out. Right now, we're having sort of a an internal roundtable with our fire um, and safety uh, folks and some PSEG people to come in. You know, internally with the building department. And make just look at it and make recommendations. Fire marshal, like let's just look at it holistically and make recommendations, and then we we can bring um, the national level uh, to the table and ask them, you know, lessons learned, what should we be doing that's different, you know, um, show them our location standards, show them the parcels, you know, throughout sure. the town that may be eligible, and get some recommendations. Um, mostly, we say in our code. Being near a substation and being, you know, of you know, sort of, in an industrial situated setting. setting is preferable to being like you know a farm in the you know view shed of everybody you know or, or like a woodland or something that's um, a wetland or you know we're obviously not going to put it in certain places but in places where don't they need to be near um, the substation substation yes they do they have, there has to be an interconnect point. There and is a, a the tremendous amount of loss of energy as you go away from yeah, the substation. Farther, farther heat how many rank. of the villages, do you know how many villages in the town have a battery energy storage system code? I don't, because they're separate jurisdictions. I don't think any of them well, do. Well, I, I can kind of answer that, because there's a confusion sometimes. We use this acronym BEST. Basically what it means is battery energy storage system. But um, it can range in size tremendously. Chances are if you see a house with a solar panel on it, they most likely have a they, well, now I wouldn't say most likely, but it's likely that they would have a battery storage system uh, for, for storing the, their power that they don't make during the day because they have solar panels. They store it at night for, for a nocturnal use. And those are like 8,000 watt systems, and those are the same batteries. Lithium phosphate batteries, the same battery that's used. And we have an energy code for, for a battery code for that, for residential installations as well. So they're pretty ubiquitous. and but. You know, people, when you start to talk about size, differential, you know, like this system, I think it's a 100 megawatt energy system, 200 megawatt hours, uh, which is relatively small compared to some of the other other systems that are installed in other places. But, it, you know, I just want to make it clear that there are, there are many homes with solar panels. It's right now in the United States, it's like... Four percent, over four percent. I just, I just make the distinction because like I think, I think people in the hamlets feel homes, like the villages homes. don't allow things that they don't find, you know, wanting in their, in their, in their community, and so the hamlets generally get all of these utility type of things because the villages simply don't zone for them, don't want them. Well, that's, that's possible. I can't speak for the villages, but I, you know, I just want to go back to the criticality of this. Without Nobody, and, and that's our, the other thing too, is I don't think even the people that came up and spoke against it, they all understand the need, and they all preface by saying, like, we understand that we understand the need. We're not against this. They're just they're concerned, well, and, and I and, and I think and that, taking and a reasonable. pause to address their concerns. That's, that's reasonable, but I also think it's important to understand how critical, what kind of criticality we're talking about going into the future, uh, and that's a big deal as a coastal community. I'll go back to that again. We're experiencing things that that nobody seems to come realize that we're experiencing right now. And it's really important. It's important for future generations. So, you know, as I said before, technology's evolved. That's, mm -hmm. you, you can't wait for it to evolve to something that evolves because you start doing it and you learn from those things. I mean, even the space and station- And honestly, years and years ago, uh, we participated in a microgrid study here in the village and we had, um, you know, looked at 
how could this village here that we're sitting in, because Town Hall is a big part of the village of Southampton as an employer, as um, people doing business here, how would we be able to be resilient and switch, they call it island mode, and you go on to like a battery situation during a storm period, and this all came out of Hurricane Sandy when, um, you know, generators were causing lines at the gas station, right? Like there's only there's only so far you can go with a generator until then you run out of gas and then you don't have really? that ability. So batteries play a role in resiliency, um, I think is what the councilman is saying here. And, and so I agree we have, we'll look at however you wanna look at it, um, you know, make sure, but at some point, you know, we should really consider, um, you know, if this isn't the right spot, then where is it that you wanna put it and how is that done in a way that's most sensitive? I, I just know that we did a lot of work on that code over time, you know, over the years, a lot of work. We and followed NYSERDA's guidance every mm -hmm. step of the way, yeah. and we did did reach out, but um, I can understand the concerns, so, you know, we're not objecting to going back and looking at whatever you want us to take a look at, and um, just with the understanding that we're not, uh, I've heard a lot of the comments too, and it sounds like we don't want this at all. And I just wonder, like, you know, where are you going with it? If you don't, you know, it sounds like we do want it. We just want to make sure we do it and it's placed in a place that everybody can get behind. Right. So on that, where is uh, the next closest one of this size? Is it in, you know, is it in Brookhaven? Is it upstate? Where are these systems to scale with what they're doing in Hampton Bays? I don't know. You know I'm John, trying to get that information. Yeah, you know, because well, I know and, there's and, one in, in one actually downtown Rochester they've done it you know I think that's one of the largest ones that I've come they have around. them in New York City too like yeah. a lot of you know just actual buildings are not even buildings they're battery storage facilities that look like buildings you know they are buildings but they're batteries inside buildings in, in Manhattan and you wouldn't even know it um, <clears throat> and they do that for the same reason I think if people knew that you know what I mean it, there, there would be more of a comfort level perhaps. yeah I'm know? saying like that's totally where we were like we've yeah. got like ma major setbacks mm -hmm. and you know but they're actually like you could be walking by one and you wouldn't even know that it was there I just feel like either we take the three months now and we we make the planning board comfortable with this we make our constituents comfortable with this or we fight every application that comes in it's, it's, I work at I mean, I know I'll feel more comfortable when people come to me and I say, no, we took three months. We took a hard look at this. We, you know, we made adjustments and, and this is what we're all comfortable with. Well, you know, and, and I agree with you, but also recognize that this board, you know, prior to, to you being on the board, had done a lot of that work already and that's the code that currently exists. And, you know, everyone can have reasons why. I'm sure the planning board has discretion to make those kind of, that's why we have a planning board is to do that. So. Uh, you know, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I also want the public to understand that this code just didn't arrive like that. No. It came out of long, no. hard work from mm -hmm. the sustainability group. I think group. it's a good code. Um, mm -hmm. Like Janice says, it has to be referred to the Planning Commission. They typically do not like moratoriums, but um, three, months. We've, three months is you know, a very brief moratorium. It's They'll probably, I suspect that they'll, might make some language like they don't like this, but they'll, I don't think they'll object to a three month uh, more term. Well, by consider. the time you have a hearing and it's adopted, <clears throat> I put um, October 31st, but it would be like three months, you know, but I, it may be less. I don't really know what the recommendations will be, you know, if it's, right. if they're. Janice, if how they'll work if out. The Long Island Power Authority, and they have a substation, let's, let's say they wanted to add batteries to their property, or LIPA on any of their properties wanted to create battery energy storage. They're wholly exempt from our zoning, aren't they? That's correct, because they're a public utility, I mean, well, well we quasi-public yeah. utility, right? They're not. Uh, so we just have to be careful, too, that we're not going to force all these things to, you know, be done by LIPA on their properties. or. We like them to be on properties that we can uh, ensure. We have some control, There's regulatory some control. control over yes. it. We can require certain things, visual screenings and things like that. If it's, if LIPA, you know, in New York State sort of goes the route of, we're just going to do it on exempt properties, then we have no regulatory control. Yes. It well, it, it's also good for us in that, you know, we're, we're getting ready to launch CCA, and part of that is CDG, which is community distributed generation. And 
it's important that that these kinds of facilities are available to store that energy that we're we're talking about uh, that we have some discretion over that as a town as opposed to, but also it allows us to put systems where we have interconnect points because that's part of what LIPA does is charge us to hook up to put that renewable energy into the grid and it becomes a, a leverage point uh, there's a cost associated with it but there aren't very many because this grid has uh, it's pretty saturated to try to find interconnect points so that's another reason I, I think that uh, it, the town should have be able to to opine on the one last use. thing I'll say is you know assuming we can address where the planning board's able to address all the you know the community concerns and get factual information out there there are some benefits besides you know the obvious global you know addressing global warming um, you know community that has battery energy storage potentially when there's a power outage um, and your you, you know your generating capacity is down or the transmission capacity is down that that community for you know, eight hours or so potentially will have power. Um, it's like having a, a generator in your community where it's other. It's actually beneficial to the community to have that. Yes. Yes. And and you know, I'm I'm sounding like a broken record, but I'll keep saying it is that part of TCA is to lower our cost per kilowatt hour. You know, we're paying right. as as a municipality, we're paying the fourth highest price per kilowatt hour in the country. Uh, that's a lot, particularly when we have middle income, fixed income, and low income folks who where that is actually substantial to their total operating budget of their homes and that's really the goal here and to do that through renewable sourcing the battery is critical to that change right because you're eventually it's sort of like a um, so we would call it ISO and they're they're you know you're you, you so storing my, energy when it's I low one, price one and using it when it's okay. peak power times and then, so, we'll, yes. then we'll move on we have three so, more resolutions to okay to, to thank you for being here I, I know we you're here for something else we, we, we have you up here. so thank you um, sure. so just to underscore LIPA could could put uh, one of these bar battery storage facilities on their on their substation across the street and they would not they would not be subject to local zoning that is correct Why it's and then somebody say, well, why don't you just let them do it and not do it here? Well, because I think that you might probably happen. need to expand the substation as well because of the fact that everybody is consuming electricity and and when you store it in a in a way like that, it's more economical and not everyone can afford a Tesla battery wall in their basement. Mm -hmm. So the people like the regular people on the grid get the benefit when you do a battery storage system like that. All right, so. Um Thank you. Thank you. So, all right. Thanks, so the next resolution uh, is 43640. It authorizes acquisition of development rights at 771, part of 791 Sagaconic Main Street, part of 135 Gibson Lane, uh, the 26, and part of 60 Daniels Lane, both the Sagaconic and the Men's CPF Management Stewardship Plan to include those properties. Um, that's the topping horse farm I mentioned that. Uh, not the Swan Creek property, but the one on Daniels Lane. Uh, 43656 um, authorizes the acquisition of lands of Shorts Pond Associates, Marsha Held, Jane Held, Linda Held, located at 264 Geyer Road and 1160 Scuttle Hole Road in the hamlet of Bridgehampton, New York, and amend CPF management stewardship plan. Uh, to include the property of oh, both of those we've held public hearings on. So, um, and then 43657 authorizes supervisor to sign agreement to lease the premises known as 271 Flanders Road, Riverhead, New York, to Long Island Head Start Child Development Services, Inc., and to the Children's Museum of the East End, CME. So yeah, that's our, that's our property up uh, on Riverhead Road. Um, that is uh, currently occupied by Head Start and, and see me. All right, does anybody have any questions about anything on the agenda? No, uh, just to say that my mother's funeral is on Tuesday and I will not be here. So. 
in, in the morning. But um, lots of stuff. Or this is a 6 p.m. meeting? Yeah, mm -hmm. so you, but you, uh, I'll try. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> it's ridiculous. No, I know. I don't, I, I, I don't mean it. I did miss one meeting, and ironically, it was for my dad's funeral. And it was a special meeting. It was a contract for the county, <laughs> a dredging contract. <laughs> in uh, Shinnecock Bay. I remember that. I would have voted yes. I know. Uh, anyway, yeah. I just trying to remember from the last meeting. Oh, the, we we held the record open for a number of things. Um, for the written record, right? So there's, there's if the hearings we close the public portion, right? Um, okay, that because we had that issue with Zoom. I just want to make sure all those things that got carried over are in this packet. But um, it sounds like they are. No, these are the only three hearings that are on for Tuesday night's meeting. Hmm. These new ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Happy. All right. So I guess uh, Sunday, you're good to publish. Yes, I'm Thank going you. to go downstairs and take care of business. Thank you, Sunday. All right. My so pleasure. we're going to move on to our next topic, which is the Riverside Sewer Project, uh, Town Law Article 12C. We are joined by Janice Shearer, our town. Planning and Development Administrator, um, Kathleen Murray, Deputy Town Attorney, Glenn Marchese, uh, former controller, now an independent consultant on several projects, including the Riverside, <laughs> <laughs> the Riverside Sewer Project. So um, this is something we've been working on for quite a while, and we're making some progress. So uh, Janice, do you want to introduce us? Sure. I just wanted to provide a brief update um, about where we are today, and that is that we have just re-upped our application to Environmental Facilities Corporation. They are the funding lending arm of New York State, and they've been instrumental in helping us through this process. Um, when you go on the intended use plan, you file all this information um, through their PLUS system. The engineers have to give them an uh, uploaded an engineering report, and um, this then allows the state to prioritize who they're funding. And there's an, an annual list, and there's an intended use list. Where so we we've, we've been on the annual list, so that each time we're closer and closer to being ready. Intended use is sort of like we have this idea, but annual is like we're going we're moving towards shovel ready, and that's our goal. Um, so we re-upped our financial information which Len has been helping us with and he's been instrumental in understanding how we would be able to do this. Um, in looking at it we broke it into two phases which you have a map. This is on our website under the um, EAF part one. The map shows two phases because the whole thing is approximately um, 47 million dollars and so if we did one phase as 25 million dollars get everybody online, and then move out to the second phase, it's more economically feasible. Um, the other thing I just want to bring your attention to is that we did receive the $5 million from Senator Schumer's office. We're working on getting our the actual money to be given no, to no, us, this no. whole <laughs> application after the application, but that's a congressional appropriation, I guess, for you. So. We're working on that, the five million. We did, requ we did request 10 million from the New York State DEC for water quality, and we were not given that money in the last round, but the new round is now due in July, so we'll be asking again. We did receive $250,000 from um, Suffolk County water quality, but the, and the whole goal is to get grants, right, mm -hmm. to fund this more so than borrowing. But the biggest thing is that we were able to go through the value engineering process with EFC, and because this is an economically disadvantaged community, we will be able to borrow at 0%, so that, and on their books. So those things are very important um, as far as the borrowing power. So with that, um, so, uh, and then it sort of gets into more nuanced things about operating costs and other things. You'll see this as a, um, another water quality request to uh, cover some of the existing flow. We want to hook up as, uh, you know, existing folks in the area and make it affordable. So 
we've always been in the catch-22 of how do we create a district um, it's it's it you have to create the district in order to get the funding but you can't create the district without the funding <laughs> so we Len knowing many many years being here and knowing many people um, bond council who was able to point us to um, a provision in town law New York State town law that would allow us to work on this and Kathleen is taking a look at it so I'm going to turn it over to her and Len to go through um, could, what could that means. Could I just means. ask you a question before you do that? Sure. Um, the referendum that's coming up this November, is there any potential impact of that on what well, you're Well, hopefully about? if the legislature does move forward with that eighth of a penny um, sales tax initiative, we would be able to apply for that money as well. So the idea is to sort of, and Len can go further into detail on this, is borrow, get as many grants as we can up front, see if we can enact this 12C pathway and as we get grants, we can pay down that debt. I'd like to shed a little light on that. Uh, last night at the Suffolk County Legislature, the legislature decided to um, to table the motions, uh, the two resolutions creating uh, the district really? and, and the sales tax. So uh, they're really putting themselves under the gun if, if they're going to do it. They would have to do it in July, of course, get the wording together and have it into the Board of Elections by August 7th. Um, so, um, so yeah, there, there was some, some debate. The meeting went in late into the evening, and uh, the, the, the legislature voted to table. Do you know not to act, not to close the hearing. Was it on a technical, technical, right. technical basis, or was there debate on whether it's a good idea? Uh, the thing? concern seemed to be on the, the wording of the New York State law, right? And the law actually uh, amends uh, the charter, and in the law it only it only referenced uh, IA systems rather than sewer districts. Uh, however, in the charter, they they yeah. mentioned sewer districts considerably, and, and so what they were what this uh, the state legislation uh, was adding uh, uh, IA systems as a viable option for funding with this new district that was created. So uh, legislators uh, felt some legislators felt that the law needed more work. And um, that they that it wasn't ready, and so they opted to table it. Okay, well that's better. Recess it, I think, is. It sounds right. technical. Yeah. There's technical issues, not necessarily that they're opposed to putting it on the ballot. They just want to make sure that it's correct. There were so also some questions about the priority areas too. You know why some areas were priority? How many people uh, in the current county system, uh, county, uh, were actually? asking for the IA systems, and there's quite a backlog, but many of them are not in the priority zone. I think there was some confusion on what a priority zone is, you know, the zero to two travel time, and through policy that priority zone could actually be expanded. Um, you know, if they wanted to do that and put money closer, uh, let's face it, it all goes into the bays eventually. It certainly goes into our groundwater. Um, so I, I think they, uh, they, they had some questions about that. They do have some time to get this done, so um, I'm confident and hopeful that that they will. Yeah, because mm -hmm. that's municipal dependent. So our like our remit program, we use zero to two, correct? Mm -hmm. So we were actually going to go to a, a wider mandate, but because of the tax incentive issue, the tax tax taxable issue, we held off doing. It. So I'm just trying to see how these all these things coincide. So it sounds like a we, all, we also had a meeting with uh, legislative deal about two months ago to try to obtain. I actually sent them an email this morning to see where we was on that. We were looking for some offset from uh, community preservation, qual uh, I'm talking about the quality side of it, water quality, water quality water side quality. of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, For operation. He, yeah, he was gonna. Yeah, he was going to try to work on something like that under those amendments, and so I was just kind of tweaking his memory this morning to see if uh, he got a chance to look at it. But so we can yeah. use CPF for the infrastructure. It's a portion of the infrastructure, yeah. right? Yeah, the, 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 exist, the, exist, the existing flow. We calculated that at about 26, 27 percent of the phase one costs could be allocated to existing flow. So if you take say 30 million and you took 27 percent of that that would be eligible for cpf funding yeah but you only have 20 percent of the total fund available to you 
to do that. To, to well, we calculated it to be program. around seven million dollars, seven and a half million dollars, and okay. I think that's, that's okay. what our. That's and we work. did request that, and you'll see that, and you'll yeah. see a what recommendation from that committee. All right, I was worried that it, it can't be used. No, it's about seven million, seven and a half million. But we could also pay that out over a couple of years. Yet to. To the operational costs for those people that no, were connected. No, that was going towards the construction part. Just the yeah. construction. Okay. Right. And so this is where this 12C comes in as far as operation and maintenance goes. Okay. So that's a nice segue to Kathleen. Oh. Thank you. Good morning. So as Janice indicated, in furtherance of this board's efforts to construct a sewer system for the downtown Riverside area, Town Law Article 12C has been identified as a mechanism to help facilitate the construction and also the financing of that improvement. So I'll briefly go through the steps that would be involved if you utilized Article 12C and more particularly it's Section 209Q of that. Um, you know, this board is familiar with some of the steps pursuant to Article 12A when establishing um, other special improvement districts. So um, it's not that different, um, but I will say one major distinction is that our 12C addresses the one-time creation of a sewer improvement versus a district. And this allows the board um, to spread the cost of that improvement throughout the entire town outside the village, not just the hamlet of Riverside. Um, for purposes of this conversation, um, I'm just going to be saying the town, but please know that every time I say the town, it is always the town outside of the villages. Um, but just for sake of expediency, I won't keep repeating that phrase, but it does not include the villages. So step one, um, and you're familiar with this, is the creation of a map plan and report, um, which is specific to the particular area of the town um, that is expected to be particularly benefited, uh, which of course here is that hamlet of Riverside. Um, and the cost of that work, uh, the map plan report is a general charge upon the town, unless of course it uh, comes to fruition and then it becomes part of that overall cost. Um, I believe that we already have engaged Nelson Pope and Voorhees to work on a map plan report when they were when we had talked about a sewer district. So they'll be amending that, and you will see a resolution. I'd like to recall and amend that to make it specific to this purpose. But we're kind of already on our way in that respect. They've also done it pursuant to the SUPRA um, provisions. Step two um, is the part um, where obviously you'll be hearing from the residents, and that is the public hearing. Um, the order calling for the public hearing must include a description of the sewer improvement, a description of the boundaries of the benefited area, which again would be the Hamlet of Riverside, the maximum amount proposed to be expended for the improvement, and the proposed method of apportioning the cost of such improvement. Um, that allocation is at the discretion of this board, um, and the proposed method of financing the improvement, um, which would be, of course, the, a bond, but certainly hopeful that a lot of that is supplemented by grant money. Um, if any part of the cost of that improvement is borne by the town outside of the villages, then that's an ad valorem tax. Um, you could uh, tax the benefited area either on ad valorem or a benefit basis. I think um, it's probably best to do ad valorem uh, so that it's easier for the bookkeeping and the comptroller's office, but that is within your discretion. Um, Does everybody on the board understand know what ad valorem is? So hopefully, okay. Yeah. okay. Um, so after the it's public okay. hearings, the, the board may adopt a resolution. Again, you've seen this before. Um, make authorizing the sewer improvement um, and finding that it's within the public interest to authorize that improvement. Um, the resolution is not subject to approval from the state comptroller's office unless the estimated expense, expense of the improvement exceeds one tenth of one percent of the full valuation of the real property in the town outside the village. And I understand from your town comptroller, Dorothy Gawlewski, that that's about $40 million is your one tenth of one percent, correct, Len? Forty-one million seven hundred and thirty thousand dollars to be exact. So it's under that. So it's under that, particularly because we are talking about phasing here. Um, so, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, if um, any portion of the cost of that improvement is spread amongst the town outside the village, which would be what we would be proposing here, then it is subject to a permissive referendum. Um, you could, on your own motion, put it out to a mandatory referendum, but there are uh, many um, difficulties I would suggest that come with that because you would have to uh, basically provide a voter registrar 
of all of the people who own property within the town who are eligible to vote. So remember in your special improvement districts and here under the special improvement under Article 12C, it's not just who can vote um, that you would find. It's not where you reside. It's not like a BOE, BOE could give you that list. You have to actually create the voter registrar because it's only those people that own real property that could vote. Only those people on the deed. Corporation only gets one vote. Um, trusts have to be looked at individually to see how that trust is aligned to see who gets a vote. So it's, it, there is some more difficulty that comes with identifying who could come to the ballot and vote. Um, thereafter, um, I'll just propose some further considerations for you. A sewer improvement, which is what this will be, is a town function. Um, so the board is going to be responsible for the management, maintenance, repair, and operation of that improvement. And the cost of that is a charge upon the town outside the village. You could offset some of those costs with user fees against the benefited area, but um, just know that that is town-wide and that will be a responsibility of this town. Now, just Kathleen, when you say it's yep. responsibility of the town, we don't have to manage it ourselves, right? We can bring in another entity to manage. Sure, okay. you could. Um, we're ultimately responsible for it. the okay. cost of that, right? Um, and at some point in the future down the road, once this improvement is withdrawn, once this facility is constructed, then you could propose a sewer district in your you know, downtown Riverside area, and then that district could lease from the town the facility, and you could enter into a lease for up to 40 years, and so then that would help pay for the operation and maintenance. So that was kind of a, that's kind of a secondary um, step. And would that require well, a vote within the district boundaries yes. of the local? Yes, so and then that would revert yeah. back okay. to what you're familiar with, which is you know that Article 12A scenario. Um, here, when we talk about phases, this is a big distinction in Article 12C and your improvement districts. Big distinction is the nomenclature. It's an improvement. It's not a district. And it's a one-time improvement. So I think the easiest way to think about it is a one-time large capital program improvement. Um, the disadvantage to 12C, if you could call it that, is that it is that one-time scenario. Whereas under Article 12A, when you have your water district or your beach erosion control districts, you're able to go back after that district is formed, right? That district lives, it's formed, it's, it lives. You're able to go back and do further improvements under Town Law 202B, which is somewhat easier, um, you know, and you get to look at those improvements and say, okay, yes, we'll pass upon that. It doesn't require state control or approval. Um, this is different, this is just one time. So after we do this improvement, if we wanna do another one, somewhere else, um, or it's phase two, that again is the process all over again. So, so is, that, again. is that process limited to what that improvement is? I, like right. In other words, to do phase two, we have to do it all over again. You don't get the yeah. continuation. It would be our intention to do the same process again for the, the phase two of this, as well as any other sewer district that the town was going to do. Sewer improvement. Sewer, sewer improvement. improvement, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm trying but to find eventually, what Eventually, is. Kathleen's right on mark that you, you know, a district, just like say, look at our water district, right, the, the Hampton Bay's water district, there's like ongoing stuff that needs to happen once you, you do the initial repair. So you're gonna have to try to form a district at some point, mm -hmm. because there's just on, it's an ongoing operation. It's not something that just is a one shot deal. So that's later down the road. And we'll there's no guarantee you're able to form that district. Well, if not, then the town will have to assume that responsibility and we'll have to make like a, a divisional this, thing or something. This mechanism, the sewer improvement, doesn't fund the operation, only the capital. It does fund the operation. It, it can fund it the operation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You could offset it with user fees. I thought you said um, it's a one time. Thing. Operation is ongoing. Think, um, I did, and I apologize. What I meant was the actual, the actual construction or the improvement is a one-time thing, but it is a town function. This improvement right, will so always be a town function. So yes, you are responsible for the operation and maintenance of it going forward. All right. So what this does is, you know, be, because that Riverside area, um, you know, from a census perspective, is uh, you know limited in terms of uh, the financial capacity of that area, a lot of areas, a lot of properties off the tax rolls, et cetera. Um, if they had to, through a sewer district, 
bear the cost of the infrastructure, assuming we were not able to get grants to pay for the whole thing, um, it would make it so that the numbers, it would, be, it would be hard to sell this to that community because they might not be able to afford the cost of and, the and improvements and the operation. So yeah. understanding that the, the hang on one second, understanding yeah. that, um, you know, Reeves Bay, Peconic Bay is, and the health of that water body is something in a Peconic estuary in general that benefits everybody. And so it's in the community, the town's interest to improve the water quality of this area. And also the, by having a sewage treatment, it will allow for economic revitalization, um, be able to address some of the blight in this area and improve the uh, quality of life for the residents, uh, not just this area, but for everyone. Um, that this, there is a, a benefit town-wide, you know, even in the villages, but they won't have to pay for it but you, because of the way the law is written. Um, so it's just basically a decision to spread that burden over a larger area. Um, and well, but it, we'll sorry. be able to calculate on our, based on an Avalorum you know, tax, what that might be so that our residents can sort of make a decision whether you know, if it's just a you know, few dollars a year for to allow this economic development and this water quality improvements to happen, you know, whether that makes sense to them. But but it's also dependent. Do we do we know what the capacity is as projected for this at this point? Yeah. So that's really your limiting factor because, as I understand it, who pays for it comes has to be someone who's receiving the benefit. Correct. So. No. no, that's no, why that's we're the using this point. section of 12C. 12C means that you can create this as a um, sewer improvement where it's seen as a town-wide, it's an improvement to our town. So everybody benefits, this Peconic Estuary is of national significance, it's, it's but, locally. But what about the people that may no, not so be hooked up to it? No, no, well they would be potentially tax like yeah. some minor amount like 10 to 15 dollars I'm not sure the numbers but well, the over only until it's okay, it's not forever right. either it's so only until that's done once they hook in and, and then you create the district and, and then these people them in. but that's based on capacity and I don't know what yeah, you know, well, then it's based on use but so when a new development right comes in and they want to hook into the system where does like they obviously have to pay money to do that Sure. Because they're, they're tapping into a system that we that the taxpayers paid to create. Yes. Where does that money go? Does it oh, go it back to the taxpayers? It goes back to that um, district. Well, it's not a district yet. It's going to come it's back to the town. Area. Yes, we, it comes back. To get used to pay off the bond? Like, well, yes, yes, it's a reserve yeah. fund. It has to go back to the All the money you get you collect exactly right. pays it off. <laughs> and then, yes. then eventually it goes okay. away. I, I didn't There's I misunderstood. Two pot, there's two pots of money, though, too. So when this hookup fees to get into the district, mm -hmm. but then once you're in, not the district, the improvement area, but it's envisioned that we're going to have two sources of funding to pay for stuff, right? There's going to be an ad valorem to pay for the debt service, and then there's going to be a need to raise some money for the operation and maintenance. Right now, we're, we're proposing a, a, a subsidy from the town outside of village so that we can limit the cost of the benefited area to what's affordable, or what we currently deem is affordable, to that area to pay on an annual basis for usage. So we think that somewhere in the area between two hundred and three hundred dollars a year for sewer, a sewer bill, is affordable. So that's what we're targeting. So we're going to kind of back into that number and say, well, in order to have an affordable sewer hookup for the current existing residents and small businesses. This is what the subsidy needs to be from the town, and so we kind of know that it's about five hundred thousand for operations, and then we got to figure out based on the cost um, for the capital improvement how much of that we need to do, and that's going to be wholly dependent upon where we are with obtaining grants. So what we're, you're going to see us doing in the next several months is we're going to be putting out an RFP to hire a design consultant to actually put together a full set of plans so that we can get um, shelf ready. And once, like Janice was mentioning, the closer we get to shelf ready, 
the more inclined the state's going to be to give us, to award us the money. Because they don't want us to award the money, take up their money, and then we're three years out. Well, they could mm -hmm. use it right away today for another project. So and when we have a set of plans and we know we're ready to go next year, we'll be prime ready for that grant. And this, this community checks all the boxes to get all of the grants. We, the only reason we didn't get it this past round is what we've been told is that we, we're just not there yet. We're not ready to get awarded because we, we have to get the plans ready. So and the, but the local matching funds are, right. are key to that, right? To, 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 to key to get well, the state. Well, a lot of these grants don't require We have a big problem, problem with it. OK, you go, then I'll go. No, I'm sorry, I just, she asked a question. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> no, it's all right. But the local uh, matching funds are, are key to getting the, the state grants. Well, it makes right. our application more attractive because we, we have our own skin in the game, but they're not required. No, re OK. What, um, what makes this more question attractive one. is it's an underserved area, so and it's right next to a, the Peconic Estuary. My follow-up question, kind of uh, along with uh, Councilwoman McNamara, is uh, once we get the Riverside RAC plan, underway right because it needs a, a sewer sewering in that area for it to happen um, those buildings th if if there are structures th that get built do they retroactively pay into the creation of the district and that money goes back mm -hmm. to the town so we'll have to decide at some future date what new construction needs to pay and that has to probably be developed in a code okay yes the plan actually does require you know all sorts of performance standards for anyone developing in the Riverside they area. They couldn't so develop they, there without that infrastructure. They must give us, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, they're gonna pay user fees. Then they have to give, they, there's other, um, they call it fair share mitigation in the CICRA, where they give us money for this, that, and the other thing. There's a certain point where it becomes, they aren't even able, you know, we can't right. do, we want them to get off the ground and, be, and it make dollars, make sense to actually build. So, you know, there's only so much they cost they can bear until they get underway. And now they're operating, they're flushing, there's people in there. So this is almost like an um, interim stop, you know, like a measure to get that going, get the plant online and operating. And then as these developments come online, yes, they um, pay us back. I'm envisioning. And then we enact a district, hopefully 51%. Or the people that would have to um, mm -hmm. be voting in affirmatively to, to get there, and then they would, or, you know, lease it back from the town. So there'd be all these financial arrangements um, to to make the town whole. Um, it's so so. The idea of it is an interim step to get us <clears throat> over that hump because right. we're always in this operating and maintenance um, problem zone where we can't do it because <coughs> it, it the it's cost prohibitive. Right. So I'm envisioning something similar to the water authority when you hook up to the water authority it's to a, a main fee. a yeah. tap in fee and yeah. then they charge That's you installation over a number of years not one shot but over common. five years you're going to pay that well the thing with this 12 C, the board the at the time will determine in some future date in five years well we want to lease this to the district but we still think that it's only affordable at this level so they can continue to say, well, you're going to pay us a million dollars, even though the cost may be $2 million. And then the district might, as formed, pay the $1 million. So those are the decisions that future boards will make on the economics at the time. So, so that, that was the, really the basis of my question before, was that, was that and I'm not very articulate because I'm not quite sure I'm understanding. You know, when we look at CDBG affordability, it's really based on census data. So and that's based on the established uh, i guess it's i don't really know how the how the government the federal government establishes that kind of boundary it's based on income it's based on a bunch of uh, other things but does that affect the eligibility of, of of the residents of that area who could can who will be taxed and the tax that they would be taxed for based on income or is it is it flush across the district well this this area uh, is obviously part of the town outside of village, so they would get taxed as part of the uh, the town paying for their share. So, for instance, if it's on an ad valorem basis, and say the town uh, at the end of the day we needed to borrow 17 million. Worst case scenario, we get no we get no other money out from from other sources and. Uh, uh, we have to borrow $17 million net to, to pay for the, this improvement. 
the whole town outside a village would divide that. That would be a capital project where we would divide that by all of our residents and, and they would pay that as part of the tax bill. Whether or not we put it on a separate line, we could do a lot of things, but it basically be part of that part town uh, tax line. Okay? Right, because I didn't want to and pay. So this, but these, let me finish this though. So then these people, the folks that live in the Riverside area are in that district, so they would have a portion of that. So they would pay part of that as well, as, as well as the people in Hampton Bays or whatever. So they would pay for that. And then in addition to that, the folks that are in this benefited area would also get a user fee, a user bill for whatever they personally use. Okay. So if, if my house, um, if I, you know, flush 225 gallons per day, you know, there's like a calculation that the county health department uses, then I would get an average bill of like $225. That's kind of the average that we're, we're modeling right now. So when we do a map and plan, Kathleen has to, our engineers are going to have to put together a, a, a report. They're working with m myself to give them the financial information. We're going to run a scenario with the worst case scenario based on not receiving any additional grants and what would it be. And then that will be, it will only get better from that because we, we would hope that the debt service component would actually be very limited. Can you add a portion of anticipated grants or? Grant. I don't think so. I know it's Not hard a, to say, that's but... Well, that's, yeah, I, that's why Article 12C really is the only mechanism legally, because right. what the state will tell you is that you can, you can tell us you, you've applied, but unless you have money in hand, you can't include that. That, that was my and point with the local matching. We never have matching. money in hand because we don't, we're not there yet. It's, it, it is, in fact, a catch-22 under that scenario. Okay. Can I ask a question about how you calculate how much CPF can go into it on the water quality end because I know we we can connect everybody who's existing. Um, I know CPF can't be used for the future growth, but to deal with the current growth, you still have to put in sewer veins, you still have to put in a, a processing facility, you still have to put in the leaching fields. Yeah, um, so even if there was no future growth, CPF would be eligible to pay for probably most of it. Well, no. Uh, we, we did a calculation of the current flow based on the current census of what's out there, and it's basically 108,000 gallons So you're gallons just taking per a day. percentage of current That's flow versus and, the and total flow of Phase one, which is 400,000. Phase one is 400,000 uh, of the plant. The existing flow is 108,000. That, le that leaves 291,000, roughly, of increase uh, increased capacity. So if you take the ratio, it's 27 percent. So that's how you calculate. So that's how we calculate. So we take 27 percent okay. of the the projected cost, which is roughly 30 million dollars for phase one, and then that gives you an upper parameter which CPF could be eligible to, to reimburse this effect benefited area. So yeah, that's, because that's you have how some, we some that. consumers that are certainly using more water than others and oh, all that, you know, no, that no, no, all you that can have stuff. that. You know, and there's some areas that we definitely want to hook up, you know, there's the mobile home park, there's things that are literally the, the, the waste is like we a, can pay a couple of days away from going into the bay. I mean, it's not that far. But we can pay 100% of that, the hookup. Yes, we can well, that's create a thing. program separate and apart from and this. And that's not even in this. No, we haven't that's gotten to that. that. We have to separately engineer the hookup course. Right. So the right. seven million you're talking about is not the it's hookup. A pro <laughs> this is a project. This is not. You know, this, this is, is just the mains and the plant. This is yeah. the mains yeah. and the plant, right. and then once you build it, they will come. Then you, then you hook people up, right? So. But, it's, but the CPF can be used to hook up the existing users. Yeah, that would be yes. our plan. And that's so, similar to your, you have experience with this with the East Quag. Yeah, yeah. right. So, so water, seven right? million so is the toward the mains, and a reimbursement program. But it could, be, uh, it could be and another Frank ten is million he's dollars. He's not here for that. Run, <laughs> 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 run. Right, right, like a hookup hook to the sewers is, uh, you know, we don't have you know exact cost. It depends on where the house is located. But I don't think it's as a, that expensive. I mean, you know, you, it depends on the well, infrastructure. See, CPF, that's in its CPF way. can pay for it. Yeah. So it's not it's, it's not income based, right? It's we no, can hook up existing. And in owners. fact, we're going to have to make at the point when with this mains are there, we're going to have to hook people up. I mean, you you, you might have to pass a, a law that requires. I think even the it's county county, does county requires you to do that. Within two mm -hmm. years of with, the sewers. Uh, once the sewer is available, you have to hook up I mean, okay. because we need the flow. 
But yeah, so we want to have that all, we'll have all that worked out and a whole program surrounding it. So then people go, I, you know, this is, I can't deal with this. Like, we'll have all that uh, yeah, you'll worked out so that do we an don't application have to. And we'll, you know, or we may just do it in block by block and just do it, our, you know, get just someone so we to can do it. Sort of the the money. Water. So the, yeah, the problem with the current CPF way, law, easier. as I understand, I could be wrong, maybe it's been modified, but if we don't encumber the money, the water quality portion it's well, it goes back to goes land back preservation. Yeah. We need it in the water quality, but so if we could encumber it, say that it's reserved for these future hookups, that yeah, you would have to give us a way to build up that capital yeah. project. I mean, we, we did, can get, we can we get did do that with Esquad. You encumbered four million dollars right. to do that from the onset of like January first, so that that was just not even part of the water quality committee. Like every you know you season, they get a years. how yeah, much are it. they just dealing with? So we understand the time frame here too. So once we've got this, you know, we, we, we get the certificate to, to start. You know, we have a design. We bid. It, we put it out to bid. You know, we've got a, a, a construction company on board. It's a three-year process. I mean, so this is not something like you go like this. This is mm -hmm. major construction, digging of, of mains and uh, sewer lines, and then building the plant simultaneously. So it's a three-year process. So over that time frame, that's when I think you can start to reserve. I mean, if you reserve now, you, you might not be tapping into that reserve for four years. So well, I, I mean, I'm hopeful there's going to be a change to the CPF. Pro program that we go to 50% water quality. We've had that conversation with Fred several times because, we're, frankly, we're running out of land to buy, and we have a priority of water quality issues that we should. Yeah, be that would be to wonderful. Yeah, and There's the committee actually question. has said to me, you know, they're not the when we have big asks like this, then it takes away from the, the you know all the other being able to equitably projects right. that come through. So. Um, but we should, you know, you're the one that will decide whether or not, you know, the full cost is appropriate to. But like you, you said know. before, I think you even said it before, this is a, you know, a transformative project. I mean, this sure. will change, once this is done, this will change the gateway to the Hamptons. I mean, it's not an insignificant investment. No, it's a big thing. It's a major thing. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Could you dig into the Suffolk County sub watershed study and find out how many? I said, how many uh, parcels are sewered? Uh, excuse me, are on uh, cesspools only, and as opposed to septic? Oh, I, I'm, you my, mean like pre nineteen seventy three? Yeah, they many. Suffolk County went to painstaking detail. They've evaluated every parcel in the county, and so that information is available. Um, we, um, we did and, in our secret analysis okay. look at that. Um, and it's a lot. Are, 15,000 um, town wide, something like that. Well, this okay. area is about For this homes. district, for, this for area, phase one and homes. phase two, I want to know how many of these parcels so have cesspools only. Almost 60%. Okay. Essentially, a pollution injection system for the Peconic Bay system. I mean, it's, it's, you know, let's call even, it what it even is. Even if they have a septic tank, they're still injecting nitrogen right. into the, the bay here. Yeah. Right. Well, that would e that would be an improvement, but uh, uh, I, right. I'm suspecting that You're many very, don't even have that. Some of these areas are very close to groundwater. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, as you as once the sewer line is down, um, you know, the, the, the planned development, which is to have retail on the first floor and apartments on the second and third floor, that's going to be allowed to happen. It just can't happen right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So all of your other plans for affordable housing and workplace housing. And Workforce housing that 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 will all be able to, to work in here. Yeah, there's quite a bit and of potential for workforce. Yeah, housing and there's going to the need to be some kind of buy-in from them, from those developers there. Yeah. So, so we'll talk. Oh, I mean, the that's code. I mean, it's already yeah. there. In terms of the technology we're employing, maybe we don't know. I I know there was a an issue when we had bought quite a bit of land, water quality based land for recharge use construction wetland use do we, do, we, do we know roughly what is being used at this point so yes and I um, recently saw that in the paper um, <laughs> we bought and the we called the Shumato parcel you when we presented it to the board um, we always knew we said okay it's a good purchase for open space or it could be used for water quality. A lot of times we say buy it with the water quality because we have more flexibility and funding. The idea was that the pipe would discharge clean, 
tertiary treated water and irrigate the wetland plants that we would restore this um, dredge spoil area. This, this whole area was always dredged and they would put the dredge material on these parcels and the um, idea was that we would restore them and put the outflow pipe to that area and irrigate those plantings basically. Um, when we went through our value engineering exercise that is still an option because of the fact that here on site we have to see in this whole Riverside area everybody's between a rock and a hard place because of the regulatory burdens in this location. So you have Pine Barrens, Tidal Wetlands, Wild Scenic Recreational Rivers, and Tiger Salamanders. Those are the big ticket um, regulatory uh, limitations, so thank you. And so this is why this area has historically never been able to get out from under these burdens. Um, not that they're burdens, because obviously there's an environmental sensitivity here. So what we've been doing is, in addition to saying, okay, and the whole, it's all in the secret analysis for anyone that feels like reading it, that the idea was offsetting, like allowing redevelopment, but at the same time purchasing open space. So we've been doing that all along. So you purchased the Shumata parcel with the idea that this is great for an assemblage. We own the property next door. This is river, you know, Peconic Estuary, beautiful place. All we were gonna do is possibly outflow pipe to it, which is tertiary clean water. The state doesn't necessarily want us to do that. However, we have to make sure that they're gonna necessarily want us to do leaching pools on where we we are now. So it's right. one or the other. So we'll they don't to like to commit to anything, but to they have to do something. We'll have to get some Pine Barrens relief. We there's, have to get some Pine Barrens there. relief. We're, we're working through all of that. So if we can't get that. that, then we're back to the construction. Well, right. Well, you, but I will note, you might recall Joyce Novak coming here with me, mm -hmm. where the Conic Estuary program is very excited that you purchased this parcel, very glad that you did. Whether or not we outflow to it or not, they're still going to give us, they are giving us money, $100,000, to do a plan for that. So it's so we still remove it. So it's a win-win-win no matter what you do. So there's no reckless spending here. This is all and public benefit. We discussed that at the time. Right. We it was it going that. to be one or the it's other? It's going to be one purchase. or the other. We always knew that. So so no now we, we thought, <laughs> let's centralize the infrastructure, put the leaching pools on site. I vote yes again. That's where we, we got them. They're and really Five cool. Towns College just so happened was right about to put it up for sale adjacent. So we said, this is a better plan. Let's pursue that and that would save us some money. It doesn't mean that you should not have used the regular CPF or the water quality for that other parcel. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, this happened recently in Watermill, we say maybe you should buy it with water quality or open space, like depending on the public will and what's going on, and then you make a decision. So right. this is this not unusual. This gives you more options in the future. Yes. And, uh, and we kind of do that on a regular basis. Yeah. I think you did. the yeah. last meeting, I think you folks amended a contract with Nelson and Pope so that they can do the test borings. So we we actually still don't know if that is acceptable, I think. I, we, uh, yeah, we think it is. We think it should be okay. So but we're still in the middle of, like, yes, you know, to Frank, I was explaining this to them and saying, you know, the state would rather us keep everything localized and not offshoot, but that doesn't mean that the, a different state agency is going to agree. So we have, like, four different agencies within the state who have to approve all this so that's where we're what you know we seem uncertain like we don't know what we're doing we do we're just it's we have to get that approval it, they, and, and, and satisfy problem. everybody and all the requirements very very complicated i'm glad you i'm glad you brought up with a lot of a lot of players i'm glad you brought up franca uh they, they, they it was well received I know Councilman Martel was there and Councilwoman McNamara were there. Their only question was, will I live to see this mm. into fruition? I, I mean, they, they were very excited <laughs> and, this is yeah. This my task. I'm I mean, gonna get this done. Len has been instrumental because the financial piece yeah. is the hardest piece because you can't overly burden an area that's already having uh, financial difficulties. So that's, we're trying to figure out an equi equitable way to make this work and then still make the town whole after it's done. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's have, have you heard from the town of Riverhead at all? I know yes. originally we wanted well, to use their alternative, and they we, didn't we, have enough. We have them, and it's a backup plan for uh, the, the byproduct of a sewage treatment plant, right? It's a sludge. Yeah. So currently the plan calls for it to be trucked to <coughs> the point, but it would obviously 
better if we can enter into an IMA with Riverhead. So we we do talk to Riverhead about it. It's just that we're not there yet, you know. Okay. That right. Well, you remember the history originally for this. We yeah. wanted to use their their system, but they right. couldn't. They right. couldn't handle the. But units. they also need to make upgrades to their system. Right. So we we're hoping that with an IMA with us for the sludge. They can maybe get we some grant money to offset. That we be paying some of it. We yeah. can co-apply to EFC as a shared services agreement and get some. Or money they could apply. That. Well, they would apply no matter what. They are trying to upgrade to what's called right. a class That's A what facility I heard, yeah. to process these biosolids. And so when we. Um, if we were to engage with them in some kind of agreement that's um, acceptable to you all, then we could, instead of, it's a sustainability factor and a cost factor to not haul that stuff up to Bergen Point, but instead put it at their facility that can now treat it and we would be their best customer. Yeah. So. Good. That's the idea we're a there. good customer. <laughs> <laughs> we pay on time. <laughs> uh, so. Except Zoom. Nothing. So what about just giving an <laughs> overview of the next steps and stuff like that? So, so um, we'll see you in a couple of years when we come back. <laughs> well, hopefully not. Uh, no, well, no, you'll no, be no, hearing no. about this in the water quality no, realm. So Nelson and Pope will we'll be revising based on a, a meeting, that, an internal meeting that we had with them um, a few days ago. They'll be revising that map plan report to reflect this different approach. Um, it's almost form over substance, but still it's meaningful. So they'll be revising some documents, and then once once they're prepared to turn over that map plan and report, then um, you know I'll come back to you all and let you know that we're going to be noticing a public hearing. In the meantime, I didn't put it on the agenda, and with your permission, I can add it on um, because I wanted to have this conversation first. And that is just that we did do a lead agency coordination because we're doing a supplemental generic EIS for this um, because in the original CQRO we didn't have the specifics of the, where we were going to do this and how we we're going to do it as you know now it's becoming more and more granular so we got you know we coordinated lead agency you may have seen correspondence on that from the pine barrens and the county and others who said they didn't mind you being lead agency right. again so that resolution would come forward where you would assume lead agency and um, issue a positive declaration which is the process for secret and then under that all this analysis falls so I'm good with it Okay. And simultaneously to the map and plan, we're going to be putting forth a resolution to either hire a, uh, a, an engineer to help us uh, do an RP for the engineer, because the design engineer with this, it's a very, our town engineer, can't, it's not in their realm of scope of practice. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we, we, uh, we, we, we need to put, we need to put a, a, an RP together to get an engineer that is going to do the actual design of this plan, and that is another big step. So we're going to kind of do that together. Yeah, like a hundred. We, yeah, we're the goal is to get to a hundred percent design. We're at like thirty percent design, and then we went through this value engineering exercise. And so now taking all this together and understanding what that means, we would then put out the specs for someone to do the full design. And we're funded. For yeah, that. and you know, yes, I'm, we have, I'm, I'm you, glad we I'll, preserved I'll our design. Dollars of previous CPF. I'm glad we preserved our design options by acquiring certain pieces with more quality mm -hmm. funds so that we have the ability to figure this out. So it, you know, it's a lot of moving parts, those but parcels would certainly be good open space parcels if they're not used for water quality. Yeah. Would if we would have purchased them one way or the other. So Right, and with the most recent purchase of five towns, we were able to, the way the plant was situated before the, the offset lines were going on to private property and that really impeded their ability to redevelop so mm. now we're able to turn it and shift those boundaries you can see it on the map it, yeah. mm -hmm. onto our own town property and, and then that way this part of space there too. yeah there and the next some, door could there could is one of those develop. lines that is still on private property yes but that's minimal compared to what it was yeah. it was like across the whole thing and so that's just you know a basic buffer um yeah so it shouldn't be terrible uh, it would be like a drive aisle or something at that point. Yeah. You know, but uh, before it was like wholly on their property. And yeah, the, ma like the main setback cool. area is wholly on our property. Yes. Oh, you might want to mention the easements that are going to have to be coming back now. Yes. So in all this, where you know, the, the, it's like this is just one of the many thing things. Now. There's a lot of easements. complications, but there, you know, there's some easements that we need to secure in all of this, so that you know, force mains do. Um, sometimes go across private property and we want to make sure that we have the legal instruments to be able to um, a put them there and be service those uh, 
means when we need to. So, so those um, we had some drafted previously, but then with these shifts, they've moved. So we just need to accommodate that, which we also have a um, That's really change typical order. For yeah. Like yeah. So yeah. we'll need to then get those appraised once we've identified them with the meets and bounds. The so we purchase done, those easements. And then we want to purchase those easements. So or Jim have Jay. an agreement with the state is yeah, one of the yeah. identified properties that, um, and Jim was working with the DOT um, gentleman to get some agreements from them for a pump station, which is like 20 by 20 area. Mm -hmm. um, so we're working through all these issues and more. And Jim's a pro at these easements. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's going to be part and parcel. Having the engineering. Now all of a sudden, that's all okay. I can talk about. Yeah. Right. Well, that's what he used to do for what the state. Right. So. Um, thank well, you. you don't know what's underground until you dig a lot. So that's one of the reasons why that's so important. All right. So we're good. Everybody had all the yep. questions answered, correct? Thank you for your work. All right. Thank your you. Continued it's work on this. Complicated stuff, but yeah. I, I believe it is moving forward nicely. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. All right. So. We're going to move on to updates. much to report so uh, uh, um, Jerry Silla who's the supervisor of Shelter Island lost his uh, his wife um, on mm. Wednesday um, yesterday um, at 67 years old uh, Veronica Siller um, and uh, if anybody's interested Tuesday June 27th at 10:30 is the uh, a liturgy of Christian burial um, at Our Lady of the ILRC uh, Church on Shelter Island and uh, interment following at Our Lady of the Isle Cemetery. And um, of course, Monday is the opening of the heart, the uh, Edie Windsor Heart Memorial, um, Monday, June 26th at noon. I don't think we have a rain date, so let's hope that. Um, no, we have a tent. We have a tent if we need it um, and um, you know there's still lots of opportunities to purchase hearts after that point that's just the you know the initial opening and uh, you know as people get married there they'll be able to purchase hearts or anybody who at any time wants to purchase hearts and the proceeds will go toward the uh, um, the health clinic uh, in, in Windsor's name so um, hope Hopefully all of you will be able to be there. Um, we've sent out a lot of invitations, so we're expecting a nice, uh, a nice crowd of people there. I, I'm, I, and I apologize in advance. I won't be able to make it for personal reasons. No, it's okay. Uh, we will miss you. Well, I'll miss it. It's been a long project. Sat in your office a bunch <laughs> over this. Thing. Yeah, it it's really, nice. it's really coming up beautifully. So. Um, well, I look to see if I have other um, updates. You guys are welcome to chime in here. Uh, anybody have anything they want to report? Nah, I'm not for this week. Quiet week in the Grove County. Anybody? Mm. I'm sorry, I'm just getting that. In my Any calendar. Juneteenth I'm things to report? I did go to a couple of Juneteenth events. Um, I've been out of it. Well, we're, we're, we, have, we have a tentative date for the Andrea Spilka ribbon cutting, but I, I won't give it to you yet, but just sort of remember that it's sometime in the <laughs> third week of, of July. <laughs> well, you know, last night I was at the uh, Suffolk County Water Authority, did a water talk. On conservation and other things, it was it was a Rogers Memorial Library here in the village. It was nice. Um, I offered some opening remarks and ended up um, answering quite a number of questions about water quality issues. Um, 
most of the questions weren't about potable water. They were more about, you know, the effects on the bays and harbors of pesticides and other, you know, and fertilizers and septic systems. But uh, the Water Authority was there primarily, you know, their focus is really on, on the drinking water that they supply and making sure that there's adequate water for fire suppression. Um, so, but it was, it was good. It was a good meeting. Um, any anything else anybody has? I don't. Know. I guess we're in for quite a bit of rain. It's needed, fortunately. Um, so, all right. So we have uh, executive session items, and let me just take a look at what we have for exec. Confidential, uh, legal, and that was last yeah, there's always confidential legal. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like we don't have CPF. We do. Yeah, we do. We do. You're looking at last yeah, week. We'll oh. get you the right one. All right, so we have confidential legal. We have personnel and we have CPF acquisitions. So um, I'll make a motion to end our work session and go into executive session on those items. Second. Seconded by uh, Councilman Bouvier. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.